And welcome everyone to our next edition of Radio Classics Interview on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. I'm Roger Hoover and it's great to have you along for another conversation looking back at the great history of Alabama football, especially in the Saban era. And so far we've had one classic game a week for you on the radio and last week it was the 2009 Iron Bowl and this upcoming week, this Saturday, we will have the 2009 SEC Championship game against the Florida Gators and the MVP of that game is quarterback Greg McElroy who joins us now via Skype. First of all, Greg, how's everything going for you? Everything's great. It's good to uh, good to be with you guys, man. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, what have the last few weeks been like for you? Obviously, we're talking to you from your home right now, but just uh, with the pandemic going on, uh, what have you been up to? And I'm sure you're anxious to get things uh, a little bit back to normal and start talking more football again. Yeah, it's been strange. Uh, this is definitely, with my job, obviously, I'm traveling quite a bit. I'm a remote broadcaster, so a lot of my time spent on the road and with no live events going on it's been a bit uh it's been a bit unusual to say the, say the least um it, we have figured out ways to adapt uh, i'm in my home studio now so like it makes it a little bit more normalized but to a certain extent it's man it's kind of uh it's kind of scary i mean there's just no telling when this thing is going to get back on the right track and no telling when games are going to be played and if games will be played in a way that we've grown up knowing games to be played with millions of people watching around the globe and hundreds of thousands sitting in very close proximity to each other. So uh, I think we're all really optimistic uh, about what college football's going to be played. It's just whether or not it's going to be done so in, in the normal season schedule that we know and, and whether or not it's going to be done in front of fans. So hoping for the best and and uh, continue to pray on a daily basis that we can get back to normal. We certainly do hope for that. And if you were in a similar situation, or if you were, say, like a college quarterback right now, how would you be using this time, maybe at home, to start getting ready for whatever is ahead, whether it's this fall, whatever the case may be when we do get back to football? No, I mean, I, I think I would just try to find some guys that I was really close with and just try to throw. I mean, lifting would not have been a challenge for me. That would have been pretty easy. Uh, to, I had a weight room set that I had access to uh, in our buddy's garage, or we had some we had some stuff lying around the house that I could have made work out of. But uh, running is easy as well because all you have to do is just go find an open field and run. That, that would not have been a challenge. What would have been really tough is to stay sharp throwing the football. And um, honestly, I, I think too another thing a lot of guys will struggle with, especially young guys, is nobody can just read a playbook anymore and learn it. You know, it, you have to go out and kind of rep it and talk it and visualize it and match plays on paper with plays on film. And I think it's going to be really hard for young guys to come in and contribute if they don't have valuable practice time and valuable reps to walk through some of the offensive and defensive formations they might have to run in the fall. So I think that's going to be really interesting. That would have been something I probably struggled with because I remember when Mike Shula sent me a playbook, I was like, oh, my God, this is the most confusing thing ever. I'm lost. Like, I can't figure this out. I'm never going to be able to play college football. But then once I got out there and started walking through things and it was watered down, it was given to me little by little, I was able to consume the information much easier. So I think throwing would have been tough and then having a real good comprehensive understanding of the playbook would have been also equally challenging. Well, what we're doing to uh, help pass the time during this pandemic hiatus for Alabama football is, as I mentioned before, uh, playing some classic games in Alabama football history. And for us, the uh, kind of countdown and the weekly rollout of the games began with the 2008 Clemson game. And we had John Parker Wilson join us to talk about that game. Uh, just first of all, when you were playing with John Parker Wilson, when he was uh, the starting quarterback for the Crimson Tide, what did you take from him the most? What did you learn the most uh, from John Parker? You know, I always was, was really close to John Parker. I mean, I, I think the world of him still, we're still really good buddies. He lives about a mile from me, so I got to see him quite a bit. Um, I, you know, what I liked about John Parker is he didn't really let things affect him. You know, he throw a pick, fine, let's go. It's all right. You know, like, and I think that was really beneficial for me to, to understand because I was a guy that had not experienced a ton of adversity in high school. Um, High school was just, we won a lot of games and we threw for a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns. But I think once I got around John Parker, like bad things can happen, uh, but you just have to be able to bounce back from that. And John Parker always did such a great job of that. And being a guy that was local too, um, here in the Hoover area, you know, he could never escape it. So he was quite literally the quarterback for Alabama 24 7, 365 for the three years that he was the starter. And I, I think he handled himself really well. 
uh, in, in that regard. So I learned a lot from him. Just knowing because I could escape to Texas and go back and see my family and nobody cares or wants to ask or talk about the Alabama Crimson Tide. Everybody at that point wanted to talk about the Dallas Cowboys you know? I mean, they, or high school football, frankly, um, more so than they want to talk about my college experience. So I had at least a little reprieve when I went home. John Parker never was able to have that, that luxury, I guess you would call it. Uh, of being able to escape the limelight. And I, I thought he just always handled himself really, really well. He was tough as nails. Um, the guy never missed a snap. I mean, even if he was banged up and hurt, uh, he was still out there grinding as hard as he could. So I, I love John Parker. Thank the world of John Parker. And I'm grateful to have shared, um, you know, the sideline with him for three seasons. My, my first three years, he was the guy. So uh, really got to watch him a lot prior to getting my opportunity on I. Yeah, he was a starting quarterback all throughout the 2008 season, which featured Alabama going undefeated, going 12-0, and and then the tough loss to Florida, and then to Utah in the bowl game after that. And then John Parker leaves. He graduates, and now it's time for a new quarterback, and you enter into that uh, spring competition. When did you feel confident in spring football that you would be the starting quarterback in the next fall for Alabama? <laughs> Um, it's kind of a funny question because I, I felt confident before spring football started. <laughs> I felt real good about how I prepared myself for the pre previous few years. I mean, I, I knew that I was going to get the first crack at it. Um, I knew that I had progressed steadily over the course of my redshirt freshman and then uh, my sophomore year while Coach Saban was there. So I knew I had gotten better and better and better in that time frame. And I was really kind of entering into spring with a ton of momentum, even though I hadn't played. Uh, I felt like I had kind of figured out how to be a college player. I was a developmental guy, and if I had played earlier in my career, I probably would not have had a ton of success. Um, but I knew at that point I was physically mature enough, I was mentally mature enough, uh, and I knew I was a good enough player to, to handle that role um, at that point. So uh, I knew probably before spring even started, you know, I mean, with all due respect to the other guys that were in the competition, like I felt confidently as most competitors do like that's my job you're not going to get it from me like that's kind of that was kind of how I felt and um, whether or not that was short-sighted um, maybe it was but all I know is that I had a pretty good first day of practice we left for spring break and then I came back day two I was still taking the reps with the ones came back day three still taking reps with the ones and uh, I'm pretty sure I took reps with the ones throughout the entire spring so uh, I, I just tried not to let up, and I, I tried to just improve and to have to have a better understanding and to be a leader, too. I mean, the biggest thing, too, uh, at least on that team, was some of the personalities that we had. You had to be a strong leader. I mean, we, we had some guys that there were a lot of alphas on that team. Uh, and and we, we definitely we came to blows from time to time, both emotionally and physically. I mean, there were some fights in that group, and uh, you just had to be a, a strong leader and, and strong in your convictions. And that was, I think, probably the biggest thing that I was trying to contribute. The problem is you can't be a leader until you play. So I was trying to establish that foundation and knowing that in the fall, once I got a couple reps, I'd be able to better impact the guys in a positive way. And did you start to feel that as the season started to go along from uh, fall camp to the Virginia Tech game, just getting that experience under your belt and gaining that confidence? Because this was a football team that started the year with a lot of confidence based off the success of the previous season. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was one of those things, too, though. I, I was so new for me. Um, and going through the Virginia Tech game was a good example. Like, it started terrible uh, for from a passing perspective. But then I got a little bit more comfortable as the game went along and finished the game really well. Uh, and then you look at the next couple games, those were subpar talent that we were playing against. So we, we beat them pr pretty convincingly. Uh, and then we played against Arkansas. Uh, and Arkansas, we, we rolled them bad. I mean, it was really, really bad. Uh, so at that point, sky-high confidence. Like, I don't think anyone could have felt better because Arkansas, I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, they had come in that year as one of the best teams in, in college football. If they were top 15, top 20, they had a really good offense. Ryan Mount was their quarterback, had a lot of pieces with Bobby Petrino. So I remember that game being pretty hyped up and us handling it with relative ease and winning the game like 35-10 or, or whatever it was. So um, I remember at that point we probably were a little too confident uh, and it, it kind of corrected itself the following week. We go to Kentucky and I remember it was really, really windy. I mean like 25 mile an hour winds. And it was just a tough day trying to throw it. 
Well, at that point, it was like, oh, shoot, all right, you know, we got to regroup. We got to regroup. That was not a good day. That was not a good day, uh, relatively speaking. And then we take that into the following game, which was against Ole Miss. And Ole Miss had a really good pass rush. And I was seeing some ghosts and trying to force some things and not seeing the whole field the way I needed to see the whole field. At that point, it was like, all right, we're kind of on shaky ground now. So I think the team certainly rode this wave of emotions throughout the course of the season. And you had South Carolina, which was an ugly game throwing the football. I played horrible. Uh, and then we played Tennessee, which we obviously needed Mount Cody to block the, the field goal at the end of the game. And then after that, we had, we had a bye week, so we were able to regroup a little bit, came out against LSU, and we were a different team. So I think this team, knowing that there were a lot of inexperienced pieces, we went, I mean, we went like this a little bit. There were some great performances, and there were some really subpar performances. We always, however, figured out a way to get it done. And I think that was what made that team really unique and special, is that if the offense wasn't going, the defense would pick them up. If the defense wasn't really playing their best, the offense would pick them up. If neither were playing really all that great, we would have a special team spark. There was just something unique about the way that team flowed together and how we were able to have each other's back. You mentioned as a high school quarterback, you had not lost a game. You got off to an undefeated start with Alabama. So for the Tennessee game, which is another one of the games we played on the radio as part of our radio classics, uh, kind of everything went to plan, it seemed like. It wasn't the prettiest day, like you mentioned, but those final three minutes, were those among the most stressful three minutes of football in your career to that point? It was, it was one of those where it wasn't stressful because it it wasn't stressful because it happened so fast. It was like the stars aligned. Like, we were in control. We were up 13-3, if I'm not mistaken. Or 12, 12 to, yeah, we were up 12-3. And it was, at that point, the way our defense was playing, 12-3 was like, there's no shot. You know, there's no way they're going to be able to get down there, get within striking distance. There's no chance whatsoever. Well, sure enough, they hit a big play. They score. All right, well, they still got to get an onside kick. That ain't happening. And remember, we had the ball, and it, and we were putting the icing on the cake, and it was game, set, and match the way we run it. Like, they're not they're not getting off the field. We'll probably milk this thing all the way down, and we'll kneel on it inside their red zone, and the game will be over. Um, so we had the ball, and Ingram, for the first time in his career, and we had been playing together forever uh, at that point. That was his second year but I mean I don't think I'd ever seen him lose a fumble not just in a game in practice either I mean I'd never seen that and him to lose a fumble it was like all right that was weird like what are the odds of that first of all I think he lost two fumbles in his whole career the other one if y'all remember this end over end out of the back of the end zone freaking ridiculous how that <laughs> happened against all yeah. but that's a different story right uh we're, let's stay let's stay focused there. um Thinking about that game, though, I mean, it was like a perfect storm for them to even get back into the game. Like, we were far superior. Uh, the only thing we hadn't done that day was score touchdowns in the red zone. And we, we didn't – we just didn't execute in some of the passing plays. I remember one specifically uh, where we had a little bit to the right trying to hit Julio on like a little pile on throughout, and it, that was a little bit frustrating. But there were a bunch of situations like this. We just couldn't score. But never felt like we weren't in control of the game. Uh, sure enough, like I said, they get the onside kick. And then even as he was lining up for the field goal, I was like, there's no way this dude's making it. And if you look at where Cody was along the line of scrimmage, he was so far left. Like, Cody was <laughs> not an option to block that kick. Like, if you look at Julio jumping up, Julio's right between the uprights, and that ball's four feet left of Julio. And that's six yards away from where he was kicking. That ball might have hit the band. Like, I, <laughs> if, if Cody doesn't block it, that ball is going to be so far wide left that it's not even like I don't know. I I wasn't as stressed in that game as I was in other games that went on later. Uh, more much more stressful situations in the later parts. I just never felt at any point like we weren't in control. So yeah, maybe when he was lining up kicking the field goal, my heart was beating a little bit, but I still felt pretty confident that he was going to miss it and, and miss it probably pretty convincingly. Well, you mentioned the stars aligned, and Alabama, of course, able to get the victory in that game, continue getting wins. The LSU game was a big statement game, as you mentioned. And then you go down to Jordan-Hare Stadium, where, especially in the last few trips for Alabama, we certainly know that anything can happen with a fired-up team hosting an Alabama team with a lot on the line. Just how was the team feeling going into that game, and what do you remember about the start to the ball game at Jordan-Hare? Well, I remember the, the interesting part was actually before the game, before we even got to the stadium. Uh, we were like an hour late getting to the stadium because there was traffic. And 
No. Was it gamesmanship? Probably. Uh, you know, <laughs> not saying that there was something up, but there was something up. We had, I mean, Coach Saban, let's be honest. Like, Coach Saban run team, Coach Saban run football organization. Like, you really think we're going to be an hour late? And by the way, how is there traffic when we have a police escort? Like, let's, let's line this thing up a little bit. But when exit's being closed, and so we were an hour late getting there. We were scrambling, trying to get ready to get prepared to go out to warm up. So we were already a little bit, you know, a little on edge. Knowing it's a rivalry game to begin with, it's a Friday, so it's a short week. We had played the Saturday the week before. Granted, it was against UT Chattanooga or, or whoever it was. I think it was UT Chattanooga uh, the Saturday before. So we had a short week to prepare. You, you remember the following year, we played on a Thursday right. uh, in order to get prepared for that Friday. So <laughs> the schedulers, the schedule magicians uh, at play, because clearly it was a little too close for comfort. Uh, in 2009, but that was probably my biggest takeaway there at the beginning was how out of sorts we felt because we had a condensed warm up because our trucks and our buses weren't able to get to the stadium uh, with enough time to go through our entire pregame routine. Yeah, and that can definitely throw you off. And Auburn gets out to a good start, and our on defense really started to pull out all the stops. It seemed like to begin uh, that football game. But the Crimson Tide uh, get the football down twenty-one to twenty. What do you remember about the final drive? Mike Johnson talked about how this offense had a knack for not just you know a four-minute drive down the field, but an eight, nine, ten-minute drive. That's what you guys had to be thinking backed up so far against their goal line. Well, it's just it's so different now. Um watching our team and watching the teams of today where it's all about spread the field horizontally you know let's let's get chunk yardage plays let's try to get guys in space let's throw it at the line of scrimmage and let guys run like we were a very methodical group like we wanted to play slow we wanted to control the line of scrimmage we wanted to be efficient in the passing game and complete a high percentage so that clock never stopped like that we were always trying to just make sure that clock was rolling whether it be uh, whether I drop back to pass or, or whether or not, you know, we're, we're trying to, to run the football. I remember early in that game, though, getting back to kind of what we were talking about at the very beginning, them hitting some big plays, like some perfect, perfectly timed plays. Mm-hmm. Like they had a double move off a corner blitz, and the guy ran right by our safety who was going to cover. Like, perfect call, perfect execution. Uh, they had a reverse that the guy took to the house. Like, the longest play I saw against our defense in, like, four years, it felt like. I mean, the, there was a reverse, and it was cutting back. It's like, oh, my God, it's 14 nothing. Well, we were able to climb back. We weathered the early storm, and we have it at 14. Uh, interesting play, nonetheless, on the touchdown to Colin Peak. Mm-hmm. Uh, I threw one. They brought safety blitz on the left-hand side. And Colin Peak was crossing pretty easy throw into the vacated area from where that safety was blitzing from. But if y'all go back and watch it, that's why targeting – uh, has huh. been implemented. If you watch the safety. I'm talking like full launch, like crown of the helmet to the head. I mean, like looking back on it, it's like, okay, well, that, that makes sense. I wish targeting existed when I play. Um, that was a totally different story, and I hate that I had to go there, but I have not talked about that play in a long time, so I just just replaying the game over and over again. Um, I'm blanking on how they got to 21. Uh, maybe that was the double move, but doesn't matter. They were up. They were down 21. I remember the whole second half, and more specifically, really the end of the third quarter, early fourth quarter, we had awful field position. We were backed up, and we we just couldn't seem to to kind of get out of their end with the student section on that side. So we were really kind of having a tough time communicating and doing everything that we wanted to do at the line of scrimmage because it was just it was really really loud. Um, so that field position played a huge factor in that game. So we had to just get something going. So what we did is we run it a couple times, hit Julio. We had a play that we really liked where Julio was running a, a shallow cross, and it was off a mesh concept, and we hadn't run it really at any point that day. But it gave Julio a lot of freedom. So if they were in zone, he could sit it down, he could get big, and I could just throw it to him on the numbers. If we got man, he could just run it out the back door, and if there was a lot of grass, they could hit it, and he would have a chance to go run and, and pick up some some key yards. So that was a really good third down play for us on that drive. I think we hit it twice, uh, and, and that was that was really important. Once we got going a little bit, we had a big misstep. We had a sack around the left edge, and anybody that knows if you get sacked on first and ten, the likelihood of you picking up a first down is extremely small. Uh, well, somehow we were able to do it, <laughs> you know. So that was that was big to to be able to come back from 
from the negative yardage play. Uh, and then we're getting around the 50. We call a play very basic. They're in simple defense because they're starting to sweat a little bit. All right, they're, they know that we're rolling, uh, so we're probably going to get base coverage for what they do. Uh, therefore, we know isolation to the X. I can throw a little curl route. All I have to do is just hit him on that right peck because he's coming back. Hit him, no problem. Gain a 12. Uh, and then we're really moving. We're starting to really starting to, to kind of impose a little bit. And at this point, I had not looked at the clock. I mean, we're probably four and a half or five minutes into this drive, and I, I'm not even thinking about the clock at this point. I'm just, I'm just thinking about, all right, keep first downs. First downs. I don't really notice it until we hit a little screen to Trent, I believe, around the right side. And he gets, like, inside the nine of Auburn. At that point, I look up, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. There's, like, a minute 40 left. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and I can tell, like, coaches, you know, clock, clock, like, play slow, mindful of the clock, mind, clock, all that stuff. All good. No worries. We run it. They call timeout. Perfect. Run it again. They call timeout. And that obviously sets a third down to Roy that – uh, that was a, you know, obviously a huge play in the game and a, and a huge play in my career. Yeah, what went into that play call? Because you've talked about it before. Alabama at inside the five yard line typically does not pass. Typically, it's power football, punch it in. But what went into that play call? Well, it's third down. It's third down and four. Um, third down and goal from the four. Uh, to get more specific, and we're down one. So all we need needed was a field goal. Frankly, um, the the problem with a field goal in that situation is a lot has to happen. Now, is Lee Tiffin going to make it? Yeah, but I, I mean, what if we have a bobbled snap? What if, you know, what if something goes awry? You know, and honestly, at that point, we kick a field goal, they still have a minute and change to get down to the 40 yard line to give themselves an opportunity to maybe kick a long one. And Auburn has historically had really good kickers. So, a field goal helps you, yeah, you have the lead, but it doesn't put the game on ice. Uh, so we are prepared, fully prepared, to run the football on third and four and, and kind of take our medicine. Instead, coach decides to call a timeout. And he goes, hey, we're going to go with we're gonna go with the, the Cody pass. And I was like, well, the Cody pass? Like, yeah, the, the, with, Cody, with Cody in the game, we're going to throw it. I was like, oh, we haven't done that. Awesome. I love it. We've been practicing it all year. That's been a little wrinkle up our, up our sleeve that we've had all season. Uh, and we practiced it every week. <laughs> and we did short yards goal line on Tuesday every week. And we literally ran that play 12 times in practice. And once in a game in my whole career. Uh, so <laughs> it's amazing. And we probably repped it 100. I mean, probably 100 times over the course of a four-year period and called it once. So we have Cody in the game. Cody's at fullback. It's called near eye left, Peter pass right, X corner. Uh, so near eye left is the formation, meaning Cody's in the game. He's in the power eye, offset to the left. Roy is in the traditional eye formation at fullback. And then we have the running back in the ball game at the normal running back depth. Uh, actually slightly, slightly closer uh, at than normal running depth because he's not trying to get a full head of steam. He's trying to kind of sell it as best he can. So they want that action to happen quicker, so he scoots up just a, just a hair. But that's that's window dressing. Uh, a little too detailed there. So long story short, uh, the X is the tight end in this case. They run a corner. Roy's into the flat. A lot of people call spider two Y banana or fire pass right X corner. Like we hear all these different terminologies. It's the same play, really. <laughs> so yeah, near I left Peter pass right. Peter is power. So fake the power, pass right, right is obviously fake it to the right, and I'm going to boot out, and Roy just has to jump leverage on the guy covering him in the flat. He did it beautifully, bluffed it perfectly. Um, it, it's really a very easy play to execute, and it was perfectly called. I mean, they were fully expecting us to be committed to the run because we had Cody in the game. And as soon as Cody goes in the game, they know it's run play over and over and over again, and once, once they made the call, we knew it was a touchdown. I got the look. I got the line scrimmage. Like, all right, the only thing I have to not do in this scenario is fumble the snap because this is a touchdown. This is a laugher. So ride the layhouse as best I can and, and make sure I get a good sell and give him a nice catchable ball on the face mask and make it easy for Roy. 
Touchdown Alabama and the Crimson Tide able to hang on and win the Iron Bowl. So confidence off of that win, I'm sure. And now you guys, as we get to the game we're really uh, supposed to talk about, you get to the matchup you wanted. You get the rematch against the Florida Gators. And for you, you didn't get to play in the game the year before, but I knew the Florida game meant a lot to you going into it. And I'm sure you felt confident going into it as well. Yeah, I mean, we had a great plan. Um, that was what I – and I was, I was really – riding a, a high wave of emotion after the comeback against Auburn. Like, I, I mean, momentum's a really powerful thing in college football. And when you do something like that, and you finally get the opportunity to really prove yourself as a player, as a contributing member on the team. Like, hey, we needed – our Heisman Trophy winning running back was hurt. We, we had to have something from the passing game, and I was able to deliver. So I think the team felt better about me being quarterback going into that game than they probably had at any point that season. Because it was our first time to really – face serious adversity and have to rely exclusively on the passing game to get us out of it. Um, so I think that was big big for me as far as my credibility in the locker room. Uh, we had other moments throughout the course of the year where you knew we were capable, but it wasn't in a gotta have it situation the way it was against Auburn on the road. And, and that can just do a ton for your confidence. So I was feeling really, really good after the Auburn game and, and felt like I had played pretty well against a good defense. So I knew that going into the Florida game, we were going to have an opportunity to probably throw it. Um, and that, that was exactly what we did. Because Florida was very arrogant. Uh, they, they knew that they had really good personnel. Uh, they knew that in a one-on-one -on -one situation, their guy is probably going to be better than the guy they're playing against. Uh, so we knew we were going to get a lot of man coverage. And I feel pretty good about our guys against their guys. I mean, that's just we match up. And we're tougher than them, or we're more physical than them. And we had talked about all about Florida for 12 months. I mean, all of us were frustrated with how things went the year before. We just didn't quite have enough at that point in 2008. Uh, we weren't quite uh, aggressive enough. We weren't quite capable of putting things together consistently. We were just uh, probably a little too early in our prospects to kind of get over that hump. And Florida was on an absolute mission at that point. You know, so in 2008, I think a lot of us didn't feel like we could win. I mean, I, I, the guys won't admit that probably, but I think a lot of people felt like we were playing with house money. And man, we just we're, we've been going six and six for the last few years. Like, man, can you believe we're in the SEC championship game? I think a lot of guys had that feeling. But having been there the year before, we knew we belonged because we had Florida on the ropes uh, in 2008. We just couldn't finish. So we already went into this game with a completely different mindset, knowing that if we play our best, we will win. There is no doubt, no denying that. So we looked at the situation, and, and uh, we had a great plan. I'm sure Mac and Coach McElwain and, and Kirby and, and Coach Saban, I'm sure that their offseason was probably dedicated to the Florida Gators uh, because there were things that were sprinkled into practice throughout fall camp. There were things that were sprinkled into practice throughout the week that we were playing Tennessee Chattanooga that we never ran. But sure enough, they were a big part of the install playing against Florida. So I think they all envisioned themselves being in this situation again. So Florida was probably the off-season work for the coaching staff. For us as players, we made it about Florida from the beginning. We were unapologetic about it. We said this was the team we wanted to get. We got them circled. Uh, we knew that we had a chance to win a national championship. We know that that national championship went through Florida. And I personally uh, wanted to destroy Tim Tebow. I mean, if you want me to be honest, like Tim knows this, like we're friendly about it. It's no, it's no secret. Um, I had a, I had a real chip on my shoulder uh, when it came to Tim because, and it's nothing that Tim did. I mean, Tim was recruited by Alabama and that's what held me back from getting my offer until late in the process. Uh, and Tim was a great player in high school and, and was deserving of all the recognition that he got in the college level for sure. But I wanted to beat him. Uh, really, really bad, personally. Uh, so uh, I focused and prepared probably as hard as ever that week. It wasn't necessarily that I did anything different, but the level of intensity was just on another level um, for everybody. And it was, they, everyone knew someone was on the line. Everyone knew that if we didn't get it done, it was going to be the exact same thing as the year before, and nobody wanted to go through that pain uh, and disappointment again. So it was probably the best game we have probably ever played. If you look at that Florida team, they were insanely good. I mean, yeah. honestly, they were insane. They were killing everybody. 
I mean, not, not – and it wasn't competitive. Like, they were beating teams like 50 to 10 every week. And we were pretty callous, and we were hardened, and we were tough as nails. Uh, but we were not sexy. So we felt really good about our plan and being able to out-physical them. Uh, we also felt really good about our receiver matchups because they had good long corners. But oh, I'm sorry, I play one on one against Julio. Go for it. But Mays is really the guy that we felt like we could use uh, to our advantage because Mays was not very big. That dude was a freaking bulldog. Like <laughs> I, I love Marquise Mays to this day for how he played in that game. Man, he stepped up, and if and he, I think, was one of those guys too that felt challenged by the situation. All right, Joe Hayden's going to go cover. Uh, Julio, no worries. Well, I'm I'm gonna go against Janoris Jenkins and uh, I'm gonna school him. Like, I, and Mays didn't care. Like, Mays was the freaking man. So, uh, I love Marquise Mays for that, and he played his freaking tail off. And I, I remember first third down of the game, he goes on like a little shin six, catches it right over the middle, gets smoked. I mean, <laughs> Mays is five eight, you know, one ninety. <laughs> I mean, he is not a big dude. He gets smoked by Major Wright, and he pops up like. I mean, so fast, holds the ball out and drops it like it was nothing. <laughs> I was like, dude, this is my guy today. Uh, he connected on a couple other big ones, too. Um, hit a little hitch. Had to throw it to his opposite corner because they were really aggressive driving on the football. So you had to really hit the pecs. You had to be super accurate in this game. He spins out and turns it up for a 20-yard for after-catch run. We hit him on like a little wheel route where he gets on top. And we find him in like a little scene between the safety and the corner. Like he was awesome in that game. So uh, it was just a culmination of so many guys that have felt disrespected for the better part of their careers, and finally having that opportunity to showcase their abilities and have that opportunity to say, "Hey, we we're as good as you. Uh, I know y'all won two of the last three national championships. <laughs> Let's get it. Come and bring your bring your lunch pail. We're gonna go have a day." And uh, it was an absolute beatdown. It wasn't even competitive from start to finish and honestly it could have been worse uh that's that's the best part about it is we could have been worse well it certainly was a great night for alabama fans to enjoy that sec championship and we're running a little short on time so we'll let you go with a couple more uh you go from there you win against texas in the rose bowl and the bcs title game to win alabama's first national championship since 1992 and now that was 2009 now here we are in 2020 i know you guys had a 10-year reunion this past fall that you got to be a part of as part of your broadcasting duties with espn but does it feel like 10 years or has some of the retrospectives and the interviews like this kind of made you feel like it has been a little bit since this all happened. It's been a while. Like you go back and look at the TV copy. I mean, it's in standard definition sometimes. Like so, you watch some games in that season. It's like, oh, we really are old. Um, it, it's been it's it's been amazing because all, a lot of us have been fortunate enough to go on and play in the league. Um, so that time flew, and I now am, am so lucky and, and grateful to be working at a company like ESPN and, and still living in college football on a daily basis. So the seasons fly by. Uh, so it doesn't feel like 10 years, but when I got back for the reunion and you see everybody and some guys, you literally haven't seen in 10 years. I mean, and, and friends like good friends, but you just lose, you just lose touch, you know, and people go their separate ways. But what was really cool is being on the sideline. And I only had probably five or 10 minutes to kind of interact with everybody before we got recognized before I'd go up to the booth and call the game. But seeing everyone's kids and seeing everyone's family and seeing everyone's wives and like that was so cool because our family from that 2019 those 110 120 guys has now grown to in most cases 220 people with with significant others and spouses and now has grown even further to maybe 350 because of kids i mean that group has just grown and the love and respect and admiration for each other's sacrifice that we really put in that year has, has really gotten better. It's gotten better with age. And the 20-year reunion is going to be 100 times more fun than the 10-year reunion. You know, and that's what I think I'm looking forward to most is knowing that we still have a bunch more to celebrate in the next couple of years. <laughs> uh, not teams that I was a part of, but teams that I know will have that opportunity to get together um, and, and enjoy each other. But it's, it's really special, man, and, and just thinking about all the different people that have gone on to be successful on that team. You know, like my dad, I would always say, uh, we watched the movie Miracle. The young, I mean, everyone's watched It's one of my favorite movies. And you look at all the, 
20 of those guys that were on the 1980 U.S. hockey team, like every one of them has gone on to be a remarkable success. Like in whatever field they chose, some have gone to play pro, some went to be coaches, some went to the business world, like, but they all 20 guys that are associated with the 1980 U.S. hockey team went on to be successful because of what they learned throughout the process of winning the gold medal. I would say that in some ways that team in 2009, I'm not comparing it to the 1980 U.S. hockey team, but I would say you look at what everybody's done and all the different fields that people have gone into, whether it's pharmaceutical sales, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's still playing in the NFL, whether it's coaching. Uh, guys have gone on to become high school head coaches that are winning games at a really remarkable rate. I mean, I think everyone on that team has gone on to be really, really successful. And that's what I'm most proud of. It's not that we accomplished something together, but that the success of that unit has continued well into our 30s now. And that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing those successes grow and, and seeing what more guys are, are, are going to be doing here in the years to come. Well, Greg, everyone at Alabama is really appreciative of your time talking through uh, some of the memorable moments of the 2009 season, and we wish you all the best uh, moving forward. And again, we hope to uh, next time see you at Brian Denny Stadium or College Football Stadium somewhere with your work on ESPN. But thank you so much for your time and what you've meant to Alabama football. We really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you guys. We love we love you guys so much. Uh, McElroy's will always be at Brian Denny. Uh, I won't always be there, but my wife and son will be. Uh, every Saturday, that's for sure. As our Tide Pride contribution still is going on, for sure. Uh, but no, I, we love Alabama. So grateful to be a part of the program. So grateful to call Alabama home. As someone that's from Los Angeles that grew up in Dallas, and I live in Alabama now because I don't think there's a better place in the world to live. And uh, couldn't be more grateful to the fans and, and for all the support they've given us over the years. So love you guys and, and roll Tide. Roll Tide. Thank you for your time, Greg. All right, buddy. All right, that was Greg McElroy. We certainly appreciate him joining us for our Radio Classics interview that's been brought to you by Alabama One. They're, of course, Tuscaloosa's best credit union and mortgage lender. Alabama One offers low-rate auto mortgage business loans plus protection for it all. With Alabama One Insurance, you can visit any of their nine local branches. Check them out online at alabamaone.org. Alabama One, of course, a proud supporter of Crimson Tide Athletics. Make sure you stay tuned to the Crimson Tide Sports Network. We'll have some more special features coming up, and the Radio Classics will be going on each and every week, plus a special football show coming up this Saturday in place of A-Day. But for Greg McElroy, this has been Roger Hoover. Thanks for watching, and roll tide.